that this intersection between your passion, your archetypal purpose, and your principles will point to your hero's journey. And that's mm -hmm. your target. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performance Life Podcast. Today, I am honored. I am honored we have a guest that is not only a hero to our country, uh, he is someone that I look up to. He's probably the biggest guest we've had on this podcast, actually. Uh, he has a huge following. Uh, the man, his name is Mark Devine. He's the, he was the highest ranked trainee of SEAL Buds. He was the honor man of his class, meaning he finished at the top of his class as a Navy SEAL, which we all know how hard it is to even just pass uh, the test to become a Navy SEAL. He was the uh, honor man uh, and some other great stories and, and uh, that I want to get into with him here in just a little bit. Mark served nine years on active duty, 11 as a reserve SEAL, and retired as a commander in 2011 after 20 years of service at the highest level. And we do want to honor you and thank you for your service, Mark. Uh, his leadership of teams was so effective, the government tasked him with creating a nationwide mentoring program for SEAL trainees, and this program eventually became SEAL Fit. He's the author of numerous best-selling books, including The Way of the SEAL, Eight Weeks to SEAL Fit, Unbeatable Mind, Kokora Yoga. He's got a podcast, which is just has a huge following called The Mark Divine Show. And what's really amazing to me about Mark is that when you think of a Navy SEAL, you just kind of think of maybe just this hard charging, really strong, you know, kind of kind of army man. And, and Mark is all of that. And he is someone who practices meditation and breathing and literally has a yoga training that he spent thousands of hours learning on yoga. He practices mindfulness and all these kind of amazing things. So Mark, thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, Talora, thanks a lot. And, and for that amazing introduction. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hope I can live up to it. <laughs> you earned it, man. You, you definitely <laughs> earned you. it. Um, so we'll kind of I'll, I'll give people a tiny bit, a little, I know a little bit more about your backstory, kind of like the basics. You were raised in a small town in New York. I know you went to school, you went to college, got your MBA at NYU. Uh, I believe you then became an accountant in Manhattan. And Ooh, then in Manhattan is where I believe- I shudder to think about those years. What's that? <laughs> I said, I shudder when I think about those years. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why I kind of like just went through that part real fast. Because then we get to the interesting part, which is while you were in Manhattan, you got your MBA, you're, I believe, a, an accountant. And then in Manhattan, you come across a Zen master who was teaching martial arts there in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what changed for you, what you learned there? And, and tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, what an incredible fortuitous uh, meeting that was. But I guess... You know, that saying that when the student is ready, the teacher appears is ap apropos. You know, I did um, grow up in a small town in upstate New York at a time when there was no martial arts up there. Uh, no one was talking about or doing meditation that I was aware of, although I'm sure it existed. In fact, downstate, I later went to the Zen Mountain Monastery in Woodstock, New York, which is where the Woodstock, you know, festival, music festival was. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to imagine the juxtaposition between this <laughs> drug infused, you know, music festival with all this rock and roll and these Zen monks, you know, literally meditating in the, in the meadow next door. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, so uh, what, what did, what was, I guess, relevant about my early upbringing was that um, I was around nature a lot because it was, I lived in such a small town, 375 people pre-internet, you know, three TV stations and um, the roof under the roof was pretty chaotic. I mean, dad was, you know, kind of stressed out and angry and aggro all the time and loud and obnoxious and drunk and, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> beating us kids up or putting us to, to work as like slave laborers. And so I used to escape into the woods a lot and used to not, not like running away escape, but like running endurance sports and hiking and just you know finding solace and making friends with nature now i re i say that because it led me in two directions one was into endurance sports like competitive swimming and then rowing where i was really comfortable just being in my own head with my own thoughts because i was had gained that comfort doing long hikes up in the adirondacks and running mountain trails alone right so a lot of similarities there Mm. So I, when I went to Colgate, I took to those um, 
long endurance kind of sports, which many people think are painful, but I enjoyed them. And I learned to control my mind. And also when you can imagine both the requirements for uh, breathing work to be done when you swim and you row, you're naturally learning how to control your breathing because those, those movements in the water, the movement has to be synchronized with the, your head turn. So you're doing box breathing or controlled breathing hmm. without even knowing it. And I wasn't taught that, but I recognized later that that was my earliest um, training and breath control training was um, swimming, competitive swimming. But and same thing with rowing, because the movement of rowing where you go really forward in the seat and you're compressing all the air out of your lungs right at the moment when you need it, because then you're going to explode back and pull those oars. So you, you get really comfortable with recognizing the power and need for effective breathing and to get as much air in as quickly as possible. And so you really develop very strong breathing muscles in those sports. It's amazing. Mm. At any rate, so that was really interesting. So when I went to Colgate and then I, I kind of blindly followed the herd of my peers down to Manhattan and got all these fancy jobs. And I was going to go back to the family business, but upstate New York family business, but I saw that happening and I thought, well, I wonder if I could get one of those jobs. And, you know, I was a, a good B student because um, I didn't really know how to study and I, and I had all that kind of emotional trauma kind of holding me back from my confidence boosters. So um, it was, it was a long shot, but I applied to some of these jobs and, and Coopers and Libran, which is now Pricewaterhouse Coopers, saw something in me I said, he, you know, he's worth a risk. And um, there was a program where they sent us to NYU to get our master's in accountings as part of the program. And so the only caveat they said to me was, um, we'll hire you, but you've got to go into this uh, NYU program on academic probation the first semester. So you got to prove yourself. You know, and if you don't make it, then you don't, you know, you lose the job. Not only do you lose NYU, but you lose the job. Well, I thought that was a fair gamble. So I did it and um, got straight A's when I went into my master's program. I'm like, huh, maybe I am smart. Look at that. <laughs> and <laughs> and so, um, so now I found myself five weeks after graduating Colgate, I'm working full time for Coopers as a budding CPA. I wasn't a CPA yet. I had to go through two years of my master's in accounting. And, and then I transferred that into the MBA in finance program. And um, I was working with this cohort of about 70 other pretty smart kids from liberal arts schools in upstate New York or upstate that region, I should say, like mm -hmm. Harvard, you know, Yale, um, Brown, Princeton, Williams, Colgate and whatnot. And um, in one night, and so the, the crux of this story to Laura is that I, I didn't want to let go of the physical skills, the physical kind of intelligence that I had developed through all of those years of training, running through the mountains and, and also swimming in the pool back and forth, back and forth and rowing. And now as a triathlete, and when I looked around me, I saw a professional class, mostly white who are all pasty and, and growing beer bellies and just not really physically fit and not happy and, and completely leaving their bodies behind. Very intelligent. Some of them, you know, on the outside happy, but they were, they didn't realize that they were on this long, uh, well, some of them shorter than others, but this slow decline that suddenly went fast in your middle age. Yeah. And I, I could see that. And part of me intuitively knew that. And this is 1985. I said, that's not going to be me. I, I just don't see that. Right. I think there was a, I think I must've been a yogi for lifetimes before this. And I've since kind of come to that realization, mm -hmm. um, that I was because I intuitively knew that you could maintain your body to be fit and strong for as long as you're on this planet. Mm. And I said, I'm going to do that. And so every morning I would get up and run six miles before work. And I would then do some stretching and some journaling. And this is all on my own volition. I was never really taught really the stretching and journaling. We did a little bit of dry stretching work with Colgate. But um, again, this is way before the advanced performance stuff that, you know, we've now take for granted because of the industry of CrossFit and the work that um, the supplement industry has done and, and everything that you've been involved in as well as me. So, um, and then at lunchtime, I very quickly said, I'm not going to go do those high carb lunches and have a drink like my peers, even though they're inviting me every day, I'm going to go to the club, you know, it was New York Athletic Club was near our office and I'm going to bang out a workout, whatever I can find. 
And so I did an early version of a constantly varied high intensity functional fitness workout, which sounds a lot like CrossFit, but it wasn't CrossFit. Mm. It was basically find some equipment, you know, use my intuition to put together a little workout, bang it out as fast as I could for 20 to 25 minutes, change, and then I'd be sweating back in the office for about three hours afterwards. Mm -hmm. Anyways, the fun part of this story and where it really connects to the Zen master is the company Cooper's in partnership with NYU had to let us off at around five o'clock for us to get down to NYU by seven 30 when the night classes started. And it's, you know, it's not easy to get around the city. You got subways and people needed to go home and change and have dinner. So there was a two and a half hour window and, and all of my peers would go home and do that. They would change, they would dinner, they would, you know, do some homework or prep. And I looked at that as another training block. And I said, okay, what can I do during this period and I, where I can still get down to NYU by 7.30 and grab a, a not a very healthy dinner at the time and go to class? And so as I was, I was pondering this idea for over a period of a week or two, and I was walking home from the subway station on 23rd Street, and my apartment was on 22nd and Broadway. And I heard all these shouts coming over the, out of the second floor, you know, of this like building that I just kind of wandered under and I stopped and I looked up and I was standing under this sign that said World Sado Karate Headquarters. And I went up and I met, or I saw, I rather, um, Tadashi Nakamura, who was the founder of this style of karate called Sado. And this man, you know, he's about five foot six and just like strong as an ox, you know, and mm -hmm. extremely intense. And he was running a black belt class and it was like intense. And then, you know, he would pause and someone would whisper or say something and I would just see him smile and then crack up like a little school kid and then get back to being super stern and running this class. I was like, this is, guy is really different, right? His presence, his intensity, but his, his spontaneous joyfulness was mm. just mind blowing. I was like, I've never seen that. And especially growing up kind of in this rural upstate New York kind of common lifestyle with a, kind of abusive father who's, you know, I love him to death and I appreciate all, all the good things that he brought me as well, but it, 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 it was new. It was something completely different. It, it, it was the first time I had observed an enlightened human being mm. and it's a rare occurrence, right? And he was one of them. Mm. So it really impacted me. And I thought, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. It's not just because I want to train physically, but whatever it is that he represents and what I saw in these other senior advanced black belts, I said, there's some qualitative difference in them as a human being that I want a piece of. I want to learn how to do it. And, and if I can rub off just by being, being here, by me being here, that's great. So I started training and I didn't know anything about the meditation, but we did do, we, we sit with our eyes closed for a few minutes before and after every class. And a few months into this, I had the courage to sit and uh, stay around and watch the black belt class on a Thursday night. And it wasn't normal. They really don't like it, but I asked if I could watch, you know, and they said, okay, here's an interested student. So they said I could watch it, but I couldn't, you know, didn't expect them to stay for the whole thing. So I stayed for the whole thing. And as, um, as it came to an end, all the students, you know, came and, you know, got in the showers. Some of them said hi to me, some of them ignored me and I was getting ready to leave, but I saw a small number, of those black belt students, the really senior ones kind of stick around in the corner and they started to bring out these little wooden benches and then they turned off the lights and they lit a candle. Hmm. And I was like, what are they doing? And so I asked someone, I said, what's going on over there? And they said, oh, that's the Zen class. Or the Zen sit, they didn't call it a class. It wasn't like an instructional class. That's the Zen group or the Zen sit. Hmm. So I was intrigued and I went home and, and you know, of course I, you couldn't Google anything back then. So I went to the bookstore and I found a the classic book on Zen hmm. called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And I devoured it. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating. I really want to do that. There were no white belts in that group. So I went to, um, amped up my courage. And I went up to Mr. Nakamura after class one day. And I asked him if I could join the Zen group. And he smiled and he said, sure. Yeah, nice. just come, you know, after the black belt class on Thursday nights, starts at seven o'clock. So that began my early love hate affair with meditation, which turned into a long term relationship, mm. long term love affair. And so it was very classic. Like he didn't speak any 
he spoke a little bit of broken English, but not, not fluently. And so the class was basically, he would, you just sit and you'd meditate and he'd give you the basic instruction. It was like Zen concentration boot cramp. I called it hmm. actually, I shortened it to just concentration camp because <laughs> it really felt like you were being punished, you know, cause you, you, you know, he would walk behind you with these sticks and you, know, you actually kind of have to ask for it. You put your hands up in prayer position. And if you're asking for it, then he would smack you over the shoulders with this bamboo sword. Oh, wow. And that was to elicit a spontaneous moment of just pure mindlessness, not sure. like mindlessly doing crazy things, but like all your thoughts disappear from your mind because suddenly you've got this, this momentary shock that just completely shattered whatever was going on. And in those moments of complete stillness, you have an opportunity to re reconnect, recognize or recognize something mm -hmm. that has always existed, but you've learned to ignore or deny or suppress. Hmm. And that's the experience of just radically being here in a present moment beyond thoughts and emotion. Hmm. And in that, in those moments that I experienced that stillness, I could see that everything that I feared was either something that I regretted or, or feared that I wasn't enough of because of my past, which was all memory, or it was some anticipated but unknown future. Hmm. And in that moment, I didn't fear or regret or have any attachments to those things anymore. Hmm. And so I said, so it was a very powerful uh, method of teaching and I wanted more of it. And so, it, you know, very early within months of this training, I said, this is something that I need to do. And I really committed to it and it, and it radically changed my life and how that relates to my story in terms of what's the CPA now doing as a Navy SEAL is, is I started that training in 1985 with Nakamura and I've trained, you know, four or five times a week with karate and I started training every day and in the morning with Zen. I added it to my morning routine after my runs and then all those, those Thursday nights. And then we went to twice a year, we'd go to the Zen Mountain Monastery in Woodstock for these four or five day long retreats where we would study, we would do Zen with the monks and then we would do karate, Zen karate, you know, eat lunch, hmm. Zen karate. It was amazing. And so what happened to me though, again, now that we know what happens with the brain of a young people as they grow, they call it, neuroplasticity, you're kind of always growing. But when you can add the power of concentrated mental training to that, when you're, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, those early years, holy cow, right, your brain is going to grow and change and transform in very, very different ways than the traditional education system, or just the common culture will um, direct it. And so I was having this, all these transformative experiences. I was having visions. I was having like long flow experiences. I started to feel much more peaceful and I started to get a lot of clarity around the story that I was living and who I was and, and um, recognizing that I was living a story that was my parents and my peers story and that I had no business being in that suit and tie trying to become a CPA, which I had zero interest in. It was mm. all being done to impress my parents, MBA CPA, yay, golden boy, who was trying to still gain their love and acceptance. And also then to, to prove to my dad that I could come home and run the family business and, you know, be a worthy son. Mm. And it wasn't my hero's journey. It was a, it was a false journey. Mm. So it took me four years of training to lower. I, I didn't quit right away, but I said, you know what, here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish what I started here. I'm going to finish it. I'm going to get my MBA. I'm going to get a CPA and I want to get my black belt with Nakamura and continue this training because I'm having such extraordinary experiences, but I'm going to figure out what my life is supposed to be during this process. And I'm going to go for that when I'm done. Mm, love so that. You can see how those tie together and the whole process of how I figured out that I was meant to be a Navy SEAL, that, that's a whole different pro or story that, that could take a long time, so I won't go there. But I tell about that story in my book, The Way of the SEAL, and also a little bit in Unveiled Mind. It, it really, unpacking the process of, of the different types of training that led to the discovery of my calling mm -hmm. is a very, very cool um, 
you know, it's, it's a cool thing. And this is it's the foundation of what I teach now today through seal fit. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard you say like, you just through that meditation, which by the way, I love what you said, the false journey. Gosh, I can only imagine how many people are living lives on a false journey, just based on what their parents or family or the expectations or whatever it is. So and, and I think the key, I, you know, I do morning thinking time now as well, which I, I, I want to talk about your morning routine in a little bit as well. But I've seen huge, huge progress in all areas of my life by just silencing my mind doing this morning thinking time often for an hour. Uh, and it's not I would call it meditation, I do your box breathing, I, which we'll talk about I do meditation, I do visualization. And it, it actually helped me realize, <laughs> kind of circling back to I think how you realize if you hadn't had been able to silence your mind like that, to do that meditation, you would probably still be on that false journey. Yeah, we certainly wouldn't be having this call unless I had another, you know, wake up moment and it and it took me off on a, on a, a better path. Mm -hmm. Still, had I waited any longer, it would not have been the Navy SEALs and I would not have developed SEAL fit and, I, you know, all the books and stories around that life path. It would have been a different path. It, um, you know, it may have been one where I, I stuck with making a lot of money. And then when I got bored with that, I went to the family business and then I'm kind of like stuck. I'm there. Mm. But maybe I would found, you know, found enough solace in keeping going with my martial arts training. And I'd be like an eighth degree black belt now. And, and I would have a good enough life. But it certainly wouldn't be the teacher that I am. Mm. And I wouldn't have had the life of the adventurous warrior, which was my calling. And the imagery that started to come to me was that. It was like before I ever knew about the SEALs. I mean, I vaguely heard about them, but you know, mind you, we're talking about now around 87 or 88, right? When I was starting to get like, okay, this is getting serious now. I got to figure out like, if I'm meant to be a warrior, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Am I just supposed to be a warrior here at Cooper's or back at the family mm -hmm. business? Or am I supposed to do something really different? So when I, I learned that, like you said, you're in your morning reflections, you, you're, you, the silence it provides like um, a still reflect a pond in your mind. And when you ask better questions, then and you drop them like seeds in that stillness of your mind, then you you get better answers or different answers. But if you're asking bad questions, or you're asking even good questions to a choppy, turbulent mind, then you, you get back turbulence and choppiness It's hard to radar lock on the right things. And so you know, I, I think that that's the, the, like a really key point because I learned first to calm my mind mm -hmm. and I sharpened my attention through the concentration training. So there are two different skills that, that accrued. And then I was able to turn that attention back inward on that still mind and ask different questions because I'd already developed a journaling practice. Now in this stillness, I would have insights and ideas and this this notion of me being a warrior that, that that was supposed to be my archetypal hero's journey. Then I could ask questions of that still mind. It's like, okay, if that's the truth about myself, that's my soul, soul's calling, then how can I fulfill that? In what way mm. should I be a warrior? Yep. And then I started to reflect and journal and, and answers would come back up from asking those better questions. And I was like, okay. So the intersection, what was revealed to me was that your 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 target path let's just say you find it between the intersection of what you think your archetypal purpose is which i believe to be a warrior mm -hmm. and what you're really passionate about and for me i was really passionate about hard things endurance sports i was a competitive rower swimmer triathlete already working toward my first degree black belt i'm 23 years old i didn't shy from hard i appreciated it. I had already learned the value that came from hard things. I also loved being outdoors and I loved adventure and I was a risk taker. And so I started to think, oh, all of those things have to play into how I am a warrior. So like, let's cross out, you know, Arthur Anderson or, or, or Cooper's and Library and Price, let's cross it out. And actually let's cross out Divine Brothers. Uh, let's cross out being a teacher at this point in my life. And so it allowed me to do this process of elimination and then, then start to work with what's left. And in the what's left category, the military was certainly there and like working on an oil rig, you know, was there. 
and being like a expeditioner was there. And so I started to work with those. I said, oh, very, okay, within this over you know, intersection between passion, what I'm really passionate about and what my purpose of being a warrior is, now I've got some other things that I'm, I can really narrow down my search. And military was one. And so I started to look at, is it, is it like flying jets and dropping bombs and dogfighting? Or is it like Green Beret Special Forces or Marine Corps, you know, Esprit de Corps uh, kind of elite fighters that they are? So I started to ask, which could it be? And that's when I learned the third component was really important. And that is what are, what are really the principles that you have that are going to guide your behavior in your life? Hmm. You might call that an ethos, hmm. right? Or your stand. And so like, so this came to me when it all came together and that, 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 that ethos part clicked in when I was walking home again one night just pondering these things because this is you know you ponder your life in those gaps right <laughs> mm-hmm. walking home most people jam their those times with podcasts nowadays but I, I don't like to do that because walking silently is an extraordinary way to contemplate your life mm-hmm. and to ask these questions right yeah. that's good training time so that's how i used it and one and that's when synchronicity happens too if you're just jamming on an audiobook you miss the synchronicity mm-hmm. Of course, we didn't have audiobooks back then, so you get, I get to learn these things, you know, <laughs> without having It was a disc with a CD, right? Uh, yeah, that's or a right. Tape, or a tape. Well, I had the little tape recorder, you know. And, yeah. At any rate, so I was walking home one night just pondering, and I, I came across a Navy recruiter's office, and I kind of like just scanning the walls, and I saw this poster, and I literally just screeched to a halt and just started staring at this thing. And it, the title of the poster across the top read, Be Someone Special. And it was, it didn't say anything about the SEALs. It just had Navy SEALs doing cool shit. Mm. And then it just says U.S. Navy, you know? And I just stared at that. And I said, you know what? That's it, mm. right? Because I, I started to recognize in there some principles, right? Service, right? Service, mm. teamwork, camaraderie, mm-hmm. you know, some things that would, would overlap a little bit with the, passionate things like adventure and risk, but they were different. They were qualitatively different. And there were things that didn't exist in my life. Mm. And so I went in the next day and I said, well, who are those people in that poster? And they said, those are the Navy SEALs. You don't want anything to do with those. (laughs) And I said, oh, yes, I do. (laughs) Tell me more, please. Tell me more. Nice. Isn't that awesome? And so what an incredible journey, all self-taught, all self-discovered, that this intersection between your passion, your archetypal purpose, and your principles will point to your hero's journey. And that's your Mm. target. When you can identify what you can do at the intersection of those three things. And generally, there's often a career, a career or a path that's been laid out for you. And if there's not, then you can at least go close enough and then create your own path, especially nowadays as a you know, the capacity to, you know, for the gig economy and, and all the ways that you can earn money while you kind of archetype, architect your archetypal life. Mm-hmm. And back in the eighties, it wasn't that easy to do, but fortunately I did have the SEAL teams. And when I said, that's what I want to do. And the, the recruiters tried to talk me out of it because I said, I, not only do I want to do that, but I want to do it as an officer. They said, dude, you know, <laughs> statistically as a civilian trying to come into the SEALs, as, you know, through the officer path, through officer candidate schools, like you that you have a better chance of becoming an astronaut. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm going to do it. You know, I was just, it was cocky, but it was built upon this vision that just said, this is it. Right. Amazing. That's amazing. Um, and then you, so, so then you get into, not only do you get into the Navy SEALs and not only do so few people actually finish and graduate right i think in 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 your class i think you mentioned i heard you say there's 119 or something people that started uh, or, or 185 185 19, 19 graduated 19 graduated and and this is an amazing story too maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the leadership things or or how how this was possible you had so you had a it's it's called a boat crew is that what it's called eight or nine right. people so we had these little boats called ibs's which they technically this is how brilliant the military is it's an act we love acronyms it means inflatable boat small 
<laughs> <laughs> and we called it an itty bitty ship. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the things like if you see pictures or, or uh, like things on YouTube or the TV of SEAL training, you see them rowing through the surf zone in these in these itty bitty ships. And that's so your team is a, called a boat crew and that's your boat. And, and you and you take the boat pretty much with you everywhere during Hell Week and you use it all throughout the first phase of training. And then you stay together with your boat crew in second and third phase, but you, you don't use the boat anymore because you move on to land warfare or diving, right? But you stay together as a team. Mm-hmm. So my, my whole team, where you were gonna go with this, if you don't mind me finishing this Yeah, story. please do. So my team of seven, you know, we, we got together in first phase and, and um, I was the leader as an officer. And the, it was something about, I don't think I was able to analyze this until years later, but something about the way that I showed up for them and the skills that I had learned with Nakamura. Um, we just like bonded really tightly together and we committed to each other that we're, we're gonna get through this together. Like we're not gonna let any one of us quit. And, um, and we're gonna just, like we're gonna take care of each other and we're gonna manage our energy and we're gonna maintain a positive attitude, right? And we're gonna get through this. And so I taught them the skills that I had learned under Nakamura. I taught them box breathing. Mm. Right? I taught them how to have a positive mantra. So ours was feeling good, we're looking good, we ought to be in Hollywood. And we would say this thousands of times a day. Nice. And I taught them how to do the recovery, you know, um, through like stretching and, and, uh, and, and really managing your energy. So I you know, said, you know what, we are capable of so much more, but we got to basically go in, in waves and phases, right? There's a time to put out 120%, but the rest of the time you're giving up 70 to 80% and that 30% you're holding in reserves. And so I taught them that it's not important to win every race, but you can't lose every race. And, and so it's best to come in the high middle of the pack or in the top quartile, right? And that's a better way of saying it. Come in the top mm-hmm. quartile in everything you do. Every once in a while, you're gonna peak and you're gonna win something and, and, and you're gonna end up like really crushing this training. And so I endeavor to do the same thing. It just so happens with my athletic background and the mental toughness that I developed with Nakamura, I was always in the top one to three finishers on every physical evolution. And because I was a competitive swimmer, I was, you know, my swim buddy and I, who was in my boat crew, were the fastest swimmers in the class. Mm. And I remember when we did our six mile swim, we literally beat everyone by over an hour. And we have the saying that it pays to be a winner. And why does it pay? Because you get rest. Mm. And so even with Hell Week, Hell Week for us was the seventh week of training. And it starts on a Sunday afternoon, sometime, they don't tell you when, you just kind of like, you're laying in your cot trying to doze and this thing like the whole world blows up like in a war and machine guns going off and smoke grenades and you know bullhorns and screaming and chaos and hoses and you know you're up down all around in the surf out of the surf and this goes on for six days straight all sorts of around the clock training no sleep well my boat crew did so well that we got secured four hours before everyone else. We got to go take an hour long shower, get in the dry clothes, and we got to go back out on the beach and watch the rest of the class get the crap hammered out of them. Wow. You know, and so it paid to be a winner. And Mm -hmm. we learned that in the first phase and and the rest of the, we just crushed the rest of the training. By the time we were done with Hell Week, our class was already down to about 70 people out of the 185. Mm. And then when we graduated, uh, um, months later, it was 19 and I was the honor man, number one graduate in my class and my entire boat crew. So out of those 19 to lure, yeah, seven of us were my boat crew. That's Alpha. fascinating. I mean, Wonderful. that to me, and I think, I don't, I don't know that that's been done before that or since then, maybe it that's has. Extraordinarily then. unlikely. It's like yeah. one, in, one in a million chance probably. Right. And so, I mean, it's just amazing. So what do you think? What do you think was the difference there? Um, I mean, you touched on it a little bit, but it's, so what, you were... it's what I taught. And the fact yeah. that here's the other secret ingredient. A team that trains this way together is 20 times more powerful than a team that doesn't just mm-hmm. like an in, it's actually more than 20 times, right? It's because you have the 20 times the individual power of 20 times. 
So what I mean by that is if I were to train someone how to integrate breath control, positive self-talk, positive self-image, um, a future image built upon a powerful belief of what's possible, what's truly possible for you, aligned with your calling, you know, and the radical ability to focus your mind in extraordinary presence on the immediate task that needs to be done. These are, we call these four, the big four skills. And I learned these skills under Nakamura, not using that terminology. And I don't think he even knew he was teaching them. But I learned later, that these are the skills that I, that I need to teach my team. And I, so I started teaching my team at Bud's that early on. And those skills alone will make an individual 20 times more capable than they formerly were. Then you put a team together and each one of those team members individually is working on these skills, but then you also do them together as a team. Then you have like 20 times, times seven, times 20 times. You have this extraordinary power mm -hmm. and you become unbeatable. And this is why I use that term unbeatable in my, when I put all this mental, this training together and said, I got to figure out how to codify this. When I launched the company Steel Fit and the government asked me to, you know, to mentor the Navy SEALs nationwide, I said, I got to, I want to really codify all of that stuff that just made us so different. So yeah. I started to codify it into this whole system I call unbeatable mind. And the government contract lasted one year basically because fortuitously, even though it seemed like a painful blow at the time, a big billion dollar company run by some arrogant Navy SEAL named Eric Prince, I shouldn't name him, but anyways, the guy, <laughs> Guy ran this company called Blackwater, and they got they were in the news all the time during the Iraq and Afghani war for being extraordinarily aggressive and getting people killed, you know, civilians killed over in Iraq. Well, he really, really wanted that nationwide mentoring program for the SEALs. It was a $10 million contract, which is puny for him, but it's huge for me. But it was, it was very prestigious at a, for him at a time when his whole reputation was getting slammed. So he manipulated the contract shop to basically to steal that contract out from under us. And uh, instead of fighting them, I went back and this is not 2005. I went back to my meditation bench and just started, you know, stilled my mind again. Everyone's saying, Mark, you got to fight it. It's fraud, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I sat down on my meditation bench over a few days and I got the message that I wasn't meant to fight this. Mm -hmm. But I, I, and in fact, it wasn't the right path for me. I'm really grateful for that opportunity and we did an amazing job we crushed it actually but then the whole thing got turned over to blackwater and i, and I released all my guys to go work for blackwater because they wanted the job they needed the job they loved working for me they knew that we were doing the right thing but they needed the job so they went to work for blackwater except for one guy who i retained robert ord who's you will meet who became my director of training and i helped me launch uh, seal fit so i said i really want to do this and develop these mental skills further. And, and by the way, on that contract, the Navy said I couldn't do that. They wanted me to just basically corral the recruits to the pool and beat them up and teach them how to swim. And even though I, I knew I would have been able to sneak in some of the breathing and, and positive self-talk, they didn't want any kind of any formula. They didn't want any, you know, yeah. like this is this. Yeah because they weren't trying to buy intellectual property and content. They were trying to buy Navy SEALs who are out in the field just being paid to train people, right? So it was a whole different thing. So it was really fortuitous that I lost that contract because I kind of like if I hadn't, I might have not be here today because I would have been a really successful government contracting company and I wouldn't have had to go deep into figuring out how to teach all these skills. Because I did that through Seal Fit, and so that government contract was a kind of the foundation. But when that went away, I launched Seal Fit, and that's when I started saying, "Come train with me at my training center in Encinitas." And for thirty days, we developed this Warrior Monk Academy. It's kind of like an American Shaolin Academy, and and the students who are all special operations students from you know, wanted to go into the Navy SEALs or the Green Berets or pararescue. And they would train with me from, you know, for 30 days straight, living on site. We fed them. They slept on site. Wow. And we, um, we did everything under the sun. And, and out of those programs, which I ran for four years, came three books, four books, Eight Weeks of Seal Fit, Kokoro Yoga, Unbeatable Mind and the Way of the Seal, you know, which spawned two businesses and three online programs and worldwide reputation because we were just did so, so much cutting edge stuff. 
that was all from 2006 through, well, through today, I guess. We've been at it for 16 years. Amazing. Wow. So, yeah. So you start off training Navy SEALs, co contracted by the government to train Navy SEALs. Um, you get that contract kind of taken out from underneath you, but it's a blessing because now yeah. you're able to start SEAL Fit where you can you can teach whatever you want. You can That's do right. breathing, meditation. It's my intellectual property, my company. The only yeah. difference was instead of one cu one you know customer, the government, who was telling me what to do, I had thousands of customers who paid me directly, and I got to tell them what to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I believe, and so then it, it did still become a hub, right? For I believe it was like something like ninety percent of the Navy SEALs that went through SEAL Fit ended up passing. That's right. right? So right. So our reputation was built. On seal fit, we never would have had the fierce reputation we day had I had I kept that government contract, and um, because of these skills that we've been talking about, those those four skills and the way that we train people, we train people not to get through buds or through green beret training, but to be effective leaders and good warriors and good people, and to be able to deal with the rigors of combat and and long term sustained stress, mm. and. Um, and also how to be exceptional teammates, you know, to lead with a hand and a smile and a, and a help, you know, a helping heart as opposed to, you know, oh, I got mine or, you know, I, I don't want you to succeed because that's a coming at the expense of me. And guess what? When you go through SEAL training, your, your coaches or your instructors are SEALs who are going to be your teammates someday. Mm. And so the number one they're, thing they're looking for, and this is true for PJs and, and, and uh, Green Berets and Rangers, they could care less how freaking tough you are because they know you have to be tough to make it through. They, they say, okay, how good of a person and a teammate are you first? Mm. And even if you may lack a little bit of the toughness of the guy over there who doesn't have those skills, you're going to be a much better teammate because we can, you know, we can tighten you up in the toughness category, but you can't tighten you up in the open heart category, right? That's just mm -hmm. got to be something that people do on their own. Yeah. So the skills of developing the inner warrior, like breath control, meditation, visualization, contemplation, um, and really, really just going deep and turning inward, that opens up your heart naturally. Yeah. And when you, when you, every time you do that work, you kind of bring a little bit more of that, that open heartedness and that, and that clarity. One of the programs that we developed out of that, those 30 day academies was the graduation event was like a 50 hour nonstop event. We still run that today, and I renamed it Kokoro. It's basically a Hell Week simulation where we take all everything we've learned and then you apply it through 50 hours of nonstop training. And the reason I chose that word Kokoro, it's a Japanese word, is because it means to merge your heart and your head into your actions. Hmm. And that nice. was what we, you know, we were teaching. And so these SEAL students and Green Bray students and others would go back to their units or they would go into their training into the SEAL training pipeline. And they were just, just like I was back in 1990, they were demonstrably different than their peers and they were crushing it. 90% mm -hmm. success rate. And the 10% who didn't make it either, they shouldn't belong there and they realized that or they got injured, you know, by some sure. random accident. So within a few years, the SEALs started to be like, what the freak is divine feeding these guys? <laughs> and it was good, you know, cause they were coming out as great leaders and they were, they were getting through buds with a smile. And then later on, a lot of those guys would come back and, and they came back and started to be buds instructors. Because mm -hmm. again, we've been at this since 2006. And so now buds has integrated a lot of the teachings of Unbeatable Mind and they recommend the book. And so, you know, they, don't, they haven't paid me a dime, but they paid me in respect. Mm -hmm. And nice. they honor the, 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 strength of the teaching and they've integrated box breathing and the imagery work and you know some of the um interior you know internal dialogue work that we teach so that's really cool so it brings yeah. a lot of credibility to the program that i have today and now we have most of our clientele are, are you know professionals you know both corporate uh leaders entrepreneurs uh, business teams mm -hmm. um but we still train four or five you know spec ops guys in every one of our our events. It's great Amazing. to see them. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I really love how everything you're doing is kind of like going back to like mindfulness and, and controlling your mind and not being reactive, controlling your breath, 
Um, so I want to actually switch gears because I know we, we don't have too much time left, but I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about kind of, I know the, you're still continuing this now, mm -hmm. uh, even though you're not, you're not in active service, you're not training to be a Navy SEAL anymore, but you talk about the first couple hours of the day. And I do want to teach people box breathing as well, because I, I, it's been a game changer for me. And, mm -hmm. and I think everyone should do some sort of breathing practice and for me box breathing just feels great and it's so simple and, and easy to to explain yeah. um but talk about so now you're still doing that i know you talk about the first two hours of the day being me time and yeah. being your mindfulness time um talk a little bit about that and then maybe we can teach people box breathing as of well of course oh awesome yeah i the way i look at it and i think this is um a lot of your listeners are already doing something like this but you know it's easy to forget or it's also easy to not appreciate the radical importance of it so everything needs a strong foundation right the, the higher you're building you want to build you need a deeper foundation the mm -hmm. higher success you're looking for you need a deeper foundation that foundation is built through the experiences and all the mentorship that you get yes but it's also built in deep deep understanding and appreciation for what you're capable of, who you are, and overcoming your internal obstacles, right? Mm. Uh, like I had to overcome the self-limiting thoughts and beliefs I had from living up in, you know, in a, a childhood traumatic environment where I was verbally and, and even physically abused. And so that work doesn't come easy and it requires introspection. It requires thoughtfulness. It requires time to clear up the past regrets and to pave the way for a future destiny that you can see clearly in your mind and you practice in your mind until it becomes absolutely a given that it will happen. And this is the mm -hmm. power of visualization work. So in order to be able to visualize with that power, which needs to be trained, it's a skill that needs to be trained, you've got to get your body in a state of uh, non-arousal and complete calm. So you've got to be able to still the water of your mind and get the body and your um, your nervous system be really, really calm. And we're all hyper aroused and overstimulated in our society. And so if we just get up out of bed and grab our phone and check our emails and our tasks, you know, our, our texts and our, we go onto Facebook, then we're, we're automatically jacking back into the hyper arousal state. And what we now know is that the pathways for arousal and, and down regulation are like railroad tracks and they're, they're, um, you know, run, you know, the, the track conductor is a neurotransmitter. And when you stay in a state of hyper arousal, which has become our, our normal state in, at least in the Western world, then you don't really use the neurotransmitters that downregulate you, which activate your parasympathetic nervous system. And so you get stuck in that mm -hmm. on position. Mm -hmm. So box breathing is an extraordinarily powerful tool that I found and started working with in, in 2005, 2006 to reactivate the downregulation path and to keep it in a permanent open so that you can switch quickly between the two. Not permanent open, but both of them are like, you, it's like you bring WD-40 to those two switches mm -hmm. and now they swing back and forth with ease. Mm. And the best time to practice that, so instead of waking up and grabbing your phone and, or immediately going and have a cup of coffee and getting jacked up, you begin a practice of box breathing and then you layer on top of that practice gratitude for positivity and concentration for focus and then um, mindfulness to begin to become aware of the patterns of thoughts and emotions that are kind of driving your decision making and your behavior in your life and then that foundation then allows you to make much better decisions and also to begin the imagery work on a, on a much more fertile mind, one that's been trained, you know, you've prepared the battlefield, so to speak, to begin this more advanced training. And the imagery work, then you use both in a retrospective way to overcome past limitations and regrets and things that are holding you back, belief systems and habits and, and uh, stuff from, from usually childhood trauma and mistakes and whatnot. And we also use it in a future perspective where we develop using the process that i described earlier of uncovering your purpose your passion and your principles you develop an, a vision for your future and then you practice that vision and it creates a memory of a future destiny that mm. becomes your destiny 
and it, and the more you practice it, the more it, it acts like a gravitational pull, and it's always with you. You can always remember why you're doing what you're doing because you've chosen what to do in that moment to fulfill that vision, and all of this is part of that morning ritual, that morning time, that me time. And I call it winning in your mind before you step foot into the battle of your day. Nice. And so I spend two hours every morning and I refine this practice and I teach it, you know, it has the box breathing, it has the gratitude, it has concentration, it has mindfulness, it has visualization. Mm. And then you go look at your uh, plan for the day. And after you do all that, and you make different decisions about what you had already planned for the day, because uh, most people's plans are really other people's plans for them. Yep. Stuff just slammed into your schedule by your assistant or your mom or your dad or your whatever. And so after you do this work and, and you remember who you really are and why you're, why you're on this planet and what you're going to do about it today, and you recognize that today is the best day to make progress on it <laughs> because it's all you got. It's mm -hmm. like the seal said, the only easy day was yesterday. So get busy today. <laughs> Yesterday's gone, right? So mm -hmm. it's easy to think about it, you know, but you don't yeah. want to live in the past and you don't live in the future. If you live right now, then this is the best day to get shit done and to become the man or woman that you know you're worthy of being. So then you uh, decide what's the most important thing I'm going to do today. And what's the most important training so that I can evolve closer to that ideal self image. And then we look at your schedule and say, when am I going to do this? And then you might, you know, I might have to cancel something. You might have to move something and you get very, very clear about what to say no to in service to your higher. Yes. All of that comes from this morning ritual practice. That's why it's so powerful. Amazing. I love it. I love it. And let's, box breathing. <laughs> yeah. Let's teach people box breathing in the, in the few minutes we have left for sure. The box breathing is probably the fundamentally most important aspect of this, because if your body and brain are stuck in that on aroused state, then it's very, very difficult for you to do these practices for you to calm down. People really struggle even using a meditation app because their mind is bouncing all around. The Buddhists would call that the monkey mind mm -hmm. or the shiny ball, ball mind. You know, you're bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. You're, and that's not meditation. That's just sitting and thinking and having a monkey mind. Yep. So box breathing is controlled nostril breathing. You breathe through your nostrils with your mouth closed and you're inhaling slowly. So you're slowing down your breathing patterns. Most people breathe average 16, 17 times per minute. The op optimal breathing pattern is six breaths per minute. When we box breathe, we breathe at three breaths per minute, five seconds inhale through the nose, five seconds, hold your breath. And when you hold your breath on the inhale, you keep that lifting sensation. Don't like clamp down back pressure, lifting, calming, energizing five second exhale. Belly's pressing in and then five second hold. And that empty chalice hold is just pure stillness. Many beginners have a little struggle with that last piece. So you can just shorten up the last piece until your lungs get comfortable with that five second hold on the exhale, or you can just, take it down to three, 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 or four, 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 four. But ultimately you want to do five in five, hold five out, five, hold, because what you're training is that five count inhale and five count exhale. Because when you're not doing this practice, which is not, this is meant to be done in a seated kind of meditative posture when you're alone, mm -hmm. you can also do it when you're driving or when you're like standing around, uh, it will have the physiological benefit, but it won't have the mental benefit. Uh -huh. The mental benefit for box breathing, is physiologically you're slowing down your breathing so that when you're over time when you breathe naturally you'll breathe in a five count in five count out which is six breaths per minute through the nose you're also developing all the muscles and the diaphragm to get in a full lung capacity of oxygen and all that prana life force when you breathe through the nose you're getting in the life force and it's stimulating the whole um ethereal system you know the, the nadis and and the chakras that form the energy body doesn't happen when you breathe through your mouth. Yeah. So when you breathe through your nose, you get nitrous oxide, which helps deliver the oxygen to your cells. So you get more energy, more power, so many benefits to breathing through your nose and yep. then slowing it down to six counts or six breaths per minute. But then also when you do box breathing in a seated kind of meditative posture with your eyes closed, what it does is it gets your brain from a high kind of high beta or gamma super agitated state with thoughts bouncing all over the place, looping and, you know, whatever the, the, the proverbial 80,000 thoughts you had yesterday, you're having again today. Well, 
it calms all that down because your brain waves settle into a high alpha, low beta state, you know, which we now know is kind of optimal for creativity, for focusing and everything. And it's also optimal for meditation. Mm -hmm. So now you've calmed your mind down, you've activated the parasympathetic rest and digest, you know, that, that pathway you're, re, you know, you're putting WD-40 opening up the, the calming pathway, which is bleeding off all that excess stress from the hyper aroused state. And so a few months of that practice, suddenly you're, you're, you're able to be very calm. Your, your breathing cycle has slowed down from 12 or 15 times per minute, sometimes through your mouth, not aware to a nice, slow, calm, controlled six breaths per minute your entire life starts to change. You become healthier. You start to lose weight. You, um, you're, you're thinking better. You're making better decisions because your mind is getting clearer. You're training your mind because you're now breathing through your nostrils. And when you sit and meditate now, all of a sudden you have that, that calm clarity that you were wondering why you never felt when you were supposedly meditating. So box breathing leads you naturally to be able to then take on the next steps of meditation, which are concentration which is, you know, for the way we trade it, that's the second step. So then the box breathing itself becomes your object of concentration. And we have you visualize the box or add a mantra, mm. positive mantra, which is like a stacked practice. So now you're getting all the arousal control. And now you're working on your attention control and extending that attention control, um, the duration, which is basically concentration training. And it, and it increases the power of your mind. Your mind, you know, was like a floodlight that becomes like a, like a laser beam focused. Yep. And so that has great benefits, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a business professional to really focus and get things done and to be less distracted and to do so in a very calm, clear headed state. Yeah. Amazing. The powers of just the, that simple practice right there. Yeah. Extraordinary. I, I can, att I can attest to it myself and, and the stress relief, right? Like for people who, when you're so wound up and you don't realize it, you don't realize your shortness of breath or, you know, and then when you just do the box breathing, all the things like oxygenates and, and your, your body relaxes your, your, your mind and mm -hmm. de-stresses you and, and all these other benefits that we spoke about. So just to kind of recap to everyone one more time, the way I, the way I do it and the way you mentioned, the way I understand, the way you just said it, I basically inhale, it's all through my nose, inhaling mm -hmm. for, um, inhaling for five seconds and letting my stomach like expand, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Relax Holding your stomach. Relax. Yeah, relax, let it not. So I'm not like just chest breathing, right? I'm allowing right. my stomach to expand for five seconds as I'm breathing in, then I'm holding it for five seconds. Then mm -hmm. I'm kind of exhaling through my nose and letting the stomach deflate for five mm -hmm. seconds. And, and then I'm holding the belly it. in at the, yep. at the hold, right? Yep. And then yeah, you're holding the belly in for five seconds as the last part. So five, 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 five. And uh, it's, it's a game changer. And to do this when you first wake up, but after you use the bathroom, drink some fresh water, mm -hmm. you know, and then get back either into your bed or into your little sit spot, you know, have a space where you do the same thing every day, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you'll develop a little energy around this practice and, and endeavor to do it for 20 minutes every morning. If it's yeah. difficult at first, then do a minimum of five minutes. And what you'll find is it gets easier and easier. And then 20 minutes, feels like five minutes. You've had that experience, right? It just goes yeah, so quickly. Yeah, I do. I, I, and like I, I would million say I, bucks at the end. And then you're like, I don't know why I didn't learn this in grade school. And then you, you know, you never stop doing it because once you experience those benefits there, it becomes as, as important and valuable to you as eating and sleeping. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And yeah, even if you just even sometimes if it's just even a 10 minute session in the morning, and then so if I'm feeling a little stressed later on, I'll do another mm -hmm. 10 minutes later That's in the day, that maybe works too. it's great yeah. to do it twice a day at a minimum in the morning and, and before you kind of re enter the home space after work is another great time to do it. And yeah. even it will help you sleep if you do it before bed. Yeah, if yeah, absolutely. It, like in a child's pose, maybe 10 rounds before mm -hmm. bed and clear your head. Oof sleep like a baby. Amazing. Mark, this has been incredible. I know we've only scratched the surface of, of what you train and coach people on. We didn't even talk about your Kokora yoga, which I think people can find some of those videos and they can also find box breathing. If they want to, to see a video of that on YouTube, your Kokora yoga. Mm -hmm. um, and just, there's so much, we just scratched the surface here. I know in your trainings, you go a lot more in depth and give people really kind of uh, systems and, and ways of doing this that is that have worked to train. I mean, if this has worked for the highest level elite, you know, athletes and, and military in our country, 
Um, just imagine what it can do for, for you. So um, where can people, what's the best place for people to learn more from you and uh, yeah, to continue their education? Well, sealfit.com we have um we have live training and we also have you know entryways into our unbeatable mind foundation course and our community which is a great way to learn these skills we have a community app and thousands in the community it's like 39 a month or we've launched these four quests in 2023 it's really powerful i'm excited to tell you more about it to laura but each of these quests are like your mini hero journey and the whole year we consider to be like a hero's journey. And the first quest is that they're all 90 days, hybrid virtual challenges with a, an event. The mm. first one is to get seal fit. So that's all the physical training mm -hmm. and mental skills, like the big four we talked about. The second one is to be unbeatable. And that's where you go deep into the whole unbeatable mind training system. The third is a search for the inner warrior. That's the Kokoro yoga spiritual practices. Mm. And then the fourth and the fourth quarter is to be sheepdog strong. And that's to bring all these skills to bear in, in leadership under fire situations so that you can not be a victim and also be the hero in a crisis. You know, like uh, we've had people uh, avert first person shooter situations at schools. We've had people pull people out of, you know, incidences like the Las Vegas shooting where they saved people. We've had people save themselves from devastating motorcycle accidents because they're able to apply a self apply a tourniquet. So in that, in the sheepdog strong, we teach, um, how to be comfortable with a pistol, even if it's not yours, right? Mm. Like how to take it from another person and to use it, mm. how to do field trauma, you know, field medicine, like in a crisis on yourself or, or someone else. And then how to do, um, unarmed self-defense through Krav Maga, which is a very effective system and, and grappling. So those are the, the, the four kind of that journey, you know, can do all four. Like I have a, uh, elite level program where you can do all four of those quests with me and also join me for a monthly mastermind that, that is kind of like my high end group, or you can do each one of these, any one of these individually. That's probably the most powerful way to experience some of the stuff we talked about, or you can just do some of the online training and you find all that information at sealfit.com. And my personal website is markdevine.com. So was, this information is very new. I don't think it's up at markdevine.com yet. But you can find more uh, about my speaking and coaching and, and uh, my books there at markdevine.com. Amazing. Thanks for your time, Delight Delore. It's been awesome. Oh, man. It's always, it's always a pleasure. I highly recommend everyone go to sealfit.com, markdevine.com, get on his email list. Um, we only scratched the surface and already um, I'm sure you got a ton of value even just from this uh, interview here today. So, Mark, thank you so much for everything you're doing in this world. And uh, yeah, I look forward to connecting with you again here real soon. <laughs> Likewise, Solera. Thank you so much. Hooyah. Take care now. Hooyah. Thanks for listening. And just a reminder, if you haven't yet tried any of our Peak Performance products, you get 20% off your first order. We have one of the largest selection of USDA certified organic superfood powders, as well as very high quality supplements. And you get 20% off your first order at buypeakperformance.com. That's www.buypeakperformance.com.